Hello and welcome back to season two of the TalentWorks podcast. If you haven't listened to us before, TalentWorks is a production company within BBC Studios and it's aimed at identifying forward-thinking talent with whom it can partner. The podcast is presented by Helen O'Donnell and me, Brona Monaghan. Thank you so much for listening and don't forget to subscribe. Daniel Howell is one of the world's most popular online personalities. Since starting with YouTube back in 2009, he has successfully bridged the gap to mainstream recognition as a New York Times and Sunday Times best-selling author, BBC Radio 1 DJ, TV presenter, interviewer and festival headliner. In 2016 and 2018, alongside his good friend Phil Lester, he also produced and starred in two global tours, The Amazing Tour is Not on Fire and Interactive Introverts, each with over 80 global shows. They played in prestigious venues such as the London Palladium, Beacon Theatre on Broadway and the Dolby Theatre Hollywood. Dan is also very proud to be an ambassador for Young Minds, a UK charity which provides free mental health support to young people. We spoke to Dan whilst at the BBC Writers Room retreat and got to hear a little bit more about his reflections on a decade on YouTube, his creative ventures and how he feels he is evolving as a performer and writer. Thanks for chatting to us, Dan. Oh, thank you very much for having me. <laughs> you are a very creative person. Thanks. When do you think you first knew you were creative? Um, I think I've just been someone that always watched a lot of stuff. Like, I always watched a lot of TV shows, a lot of cartoons. And then when the school play did something, I got really involved in it. So I think from a very young age, I was just like, I really enjoy performing in some way. And then when the school had like a drama club or whatever, I'd be like, yeah, I want to get involved in that. I'll make up a little comedy sketch with my friends and whatever. And that was just like fun messing around, you know, like trying to do like a crap kids version of what you see on TV. Yeah. Do you remember any of your sketches? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's always like when you're 13, you think that you're like super cool. So me and my friends did one where we were like, oh, yeah, we're a bunch of people and we're like all on drugs and like this thing's going to open and it's going to like play the Teletubbies theme. But we're all just going to be like injecting drugs. And my drama teacher was like, what's wrong with you children? <laughs> it's like, why is drugs the Yeah, there? I was like, and it Punch was like, like capital D. I didn't know what that meant, you know what I mean? But just when I was 13, I was like, yeah, this is cutting edge. Do you come from a creative family? God, no. <laughs> no offense all offense no like people oh my god i'm just trying to think nothing there's nothing there is a desert uh no it's literally just myself and then i just formed hobbies and interests and it just happened mm. so the first thing that made you popular was your youtube videos yes how long were you thinking about making a youtube video before you did Ooh, um, well, I was one of those people, like, YouTube's so old now. This is the thing. People still talk about YouTube as if it's new. And this year, 2019, is going to be the 10th anniversary of my YouTube career, which is ridiculous. Like, I've been doing just YouTube videos for 10 years now, which is insane. But before that, I was a teenager just watching people who made videos for, like, four or five years. So I made my YouTube account in, like, 2006. And there was already a community of people that were just like making their own sketch comedy doing like just funny videos telling stories and they were just sending them to each other or you know anyone that wanted to tell a story anyone that would just wanted to like make a little short film you'd put it on the internet and there was just a tiny community of people that just like watched each other's stuff and I was just like this looks fun in the same way that I'd be like oh me and my friends want to mess around in the playground I want to really make like a fun YouTube video like some of these people that I watch so I got into it literally just as like a hobby and then it accidentally became my career. So, my name is Dan. Nice to meet you. And this is my first proper video, I guess. Did you tell any of your friends that you were going to do it? Oh, God, no. no. No, it was still, like, so weird at the time. It was, YouTube was a place where you watched videos of people falling down the stairs and cat videos. It wasn't, like, a place for content. Uh, and it was like being on the internet was still seen as like nerdy and weird and a bad thing, which is so strange now because it's like social media is just life. Like everyone has Facebook and Instagram. But back in the day, if you were someone that had a MySpace, you were a bit weird almost. And then like if you were somebody that used YouTube, you were like an outcast in some strange way. It's just bizarre thinking that it was something that I was like embarrassed for certain real life friends to know about. Mm. So talk us through your creative process for making a video. 
Uh, well, I make my video style is me talking about a topic. It's basically like stand up to a camera. Uh, so it's just me talking about something, telling a story. So I'll usually just think of a topic. It's what's one thing that I like, I desperately need to force the world to listen to what I have to say on this topic. So I'll just sit down thinking. Sometimes it's what would be funny. Um, one of them was just uh, awkward handshakes is one that I made in like 2011, which is, you know how there's like the normal handshake and then there's the one that guys do. And I sound like so like white and lame by saying this, but yeah, you know, you know, you know what I mean? It's like the thing where you like, you, it's like at an angle and then you slap each other's backs. Is there a word for that? Is there a name for that? But I literally, I was like, I'm going to make an entire video about how I don't know what it is and I don't know how to do it. And there's loads of different kinds and certain people come up to you and they just do it. And I'm like, I, I never grew up doing that. So now it's like this totally alien movement. So I literally wrote a five minute video complete with like sketches demonstrating exactly what I'm talking about. Just about stupid handshakes and uploaded it. And then people were like, yeah, good point. So did you like stand up before kind of subconsciously making a sort of stand-up routine yeah well i just liked watching a lot of comedy on tv you know my dad was a court person that would always have have i got news for you and mock the week and live at the apollo on in the background so i just watched a lot of that and then i i just think i naturally absorbed references from so much like movies tv shows panel shows whatever that even though i had no formal training and i was literally just like a teenager messing around i probably had all these references on my head just from stuff i watched so to me i felt like yeah i can do this this is something i want to do and it made sense which is probably just because i watched so much of it so has your creative process changed now your audience has grown so do you find yourself Mm. censoring yourself or considering the content more um I think that some people do, and to an extent you probably should. Like, you have a responsibility if you have a big audience. Um, I'm obsessed neurotically with trying to kind of stay authentic, though. So my biggest concern is always, I just want to be doing whatever is totally me. So I really try to think I don't want to change anything at all, but... It's just a fact that when you have a bigger audience, you have to be more responsible about the things that you say. Not that I'm likely to do anything bad, but that's just, you know, bigger power, bigger responsibility. And what, I guess, what's been the biggest impact on your channel? Is there anything that's happened sort of in pop culture or the way the internet has evolved that is sort of kind of assimilated into uh, Mm. what you do online? I think that... I've always made videos about very personal things or opinions. So sometimes when I've made opinions on things that were happening in pop culture at a time, that's when it reached a wider audience. So it's like one of my first videos that got quite big was one about fan fiction. And this was in 2012 when most of Earth hadn't heard of it at all. So it was this time where suddenly, because of Tumblr and, you know, social media, the concept of it was blowing up. Some people were like, this is cool, this is fun, this is a creative hobby, this is weird, I don't like this. And because it was new to so many people, it was just like, wow, have you heard of this thing? Have you seen this thing? And I kind of made a video about it at the right time. And that was a a really cool example of that. But usually it's just a like I've never gone viral or had a, a big hit that's made a big impact to my career. Like I've had a video that's done a bit better than usual. But if you were to look at a graph of the last 10 years of my YouTube channel, it's like a 45 degree angle of, yep, it just slowly crawled up the whole time. There's this concept. They're like, oh, you, you came from the Internet. When did you go viral? So like, I've never gone viral. I always be like, oh, I, hope, I really hope one day I'm going to be like one of these 10 year old Americans that just becomes like really famous overnight. It never, ever happened. I just slowly got to where I was over 10 years. So over those 10 years, you've also done a lot of stuff off platform. Mm. So you've done your books and your your stage shows. How do you find collaborating with others? Uh, I love it. I think that YouTube writing or what I do, or like it's any self-employed creative person. And I think it's a lot of thing that writers do. It's quite isolating. And especially if anyone's a writer performer, it's, a fun experience where you get all of the control but it's very lonely and especially because I'm not doing anything for a platform like if it was BBC and I was a writer performer you know people would still look at the script I've had an editor a commissioner a producer there's a bit of opinions but obviously YouTube where you do it yourself it's just you so it's fun to have unlimited power but then it's also like it's nice to have help from other people so anytime I've 
you know done radio or done a book and got to work with other people i really really enjoy just having their creative input it's hard for anyone that comes from the internet who's used to having total control of anything they do to have to accept that you're working with a team now you actually have to listen to what other people say you might even have to follow a brief and then it's like no i do what i want and say what i want uh but no i really enjoy it i like being able to do both we we like to ask all our guests um is there a particular talent or uh, a certain piece of work that's really inspired you or had a big impact on you? And it could be a film, a TV show, a book, a comedian, a, an actor. A single one. God, I'm just, I'm not sure about that. I just think it's everything I watched in like British comedy that was on TV in the noughties. I just absorbed all of it. And then if you just asked me to make something, I just had this voice already, which was my personal experience, plus this mash of everything that was on BBC One, Two and Channel Four for 10 years. So there's no one person where I'm like, oh, yeah, Russell Howard, he's my dream. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I want to follow in his footsteps. But like probably six percent of my DNA is Russell Howard's good news somewhere just because I watched 20 episodes. You know what I mean? So do you like the idea of sort of a, like a, a panel style sort of commentary? show is it is that something that you'd like to sort of innovate yourself it's funny because there's so many different kinds of comedy that are on these days i feel i don't know if like panel shows are hot and they're the future anymore um i mean i'm definitely because what i've done is a lot of writing for my own videos i've done stage shows did radio did a book the things that i'm looking forward to do in the future is more like comedy acting in something or like writing a script because that's something i haven't done i think that panel shows are good but because i come from this completely different generation you feel like all the stuff like panel show audiences that watch tv they're probably people like on average in their 40s or 50s that watch it so it's like would i like to go and have i got news for you it's like mm, oh you know i could probably do it and like write some jokes and i could have a good time like that's that's just not my generation like at all you know what i mean so uh i like watching them but that just doesn't seem like the world that i ended up being a part of so we're currently on a writer's retreat with mm. the BBC Writer's Room. Has there been anything that you've that stood out over the week that uh, will you'll take away? Yeah, what's been interesting is a lot of people that uh, come from the internet, so comedians that emerged from like Twitter or YouTube or Instagram or Vine, they're people that obviously have comedy talent and voices because they've made this good stuff, but they've had no formal training. Like they didn't go to a, like a school. They didn't do a course on anything. They never even went through a formal process of learning. So nobody has these formal skills. They don't understand kind of the traditional way that someone could construct a joke or write a show or tell a story, but just naturally they just have a feeling for how to make jokes and something. So what's been interesting this week is we've had sessions on, you know, like how people that write for topical comedy on panel shows actually go about and do that and it's interesting because a lot of people are like oh okay well i i probably could have sat down for 10 minutes and written some jokes but now i un i understand how professionals actually do it so it's been really interesting to kind of work backwards from my own ability and kind of understand almost my own creative process a bit more which is really interesting but it's definitely made it easier i think to create in the future that's good. I think um, you particularly have been like a real sponge, like taking things in. Yeah, and nodding then a lot. <laughs> almost like, like you can see in a lot of your the body of work today, mm. some of these structures that have been employed, but you just didn't know. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the, one of the ones we were doing today was just on writing for sitcoms and series. And so it was all about, you know, Hero's Journey, that kind of typical stuff. And we were discussing how at the crux of it, it's just all storytelling is basically, it's, it's always going to have an introduction, a middle and an end, and that's everything. And, you know, you go to film school and you learn that actually there's this theory called the hero's journey and it's the, you know, this, but it doesn't have to be like that. It's actually just common sense to anyone that's ever heard like a family member tell an anecdote. So again, it's just really interesting to learn the kind of, um, classical way that people explain it and then it allows you to look in the mirror and go oh that is what we're all actually doing all the time because you have done narrative long form mm. like the the stage shows that you've done yeah are especially the first the one. first one yeah. in particular yeah if somebody didn't see that show can you describe it it was almost like, I'm just going to use a cultural reference, me and my friend Phil, we uploaded a lot of videos and over the years of our audience watching it, they, 
there were sort of memes. There became a lot of like references and running gags and infamous things that we did. And we wanted to do a stage show that had lots of funny moments, but also for these people that came to see us for the first time in real life, kind of celebrated kind of like the last five, six years of all these funny things that we all knew. So it was like this Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. It was a high concept story. It really had a narrative and it's mental when you think about it, uh, where it was, you know, a mix of comedy and stand up and some improv bits with this storyline that was motivated by like pop culture references about our own content, which was really interesting, but it definitely had a beginning, a middle, and end. There was a bit where I had an existential crisis and I was like, oh no, oh, we've hit a brick wall, just don't know where I'm going anymore. Plot twist, climax, the end. And it's like, well, there we go. Our silly stage show was a, a blockbuster film. Who knew? And with the second show, mm. Interactive Introverts, are you, a, are you a fan of sort of the audience participation and the audience choosing how a show goes. Yeah, well, it was wild. Well, the first time we were just thinking, like, what will people enjoy? And the second time I got round to it, I was really thinking, like, <laughs> it's going to sound stupid, but, like, what is, what should live entertainment be? Like, what should live comedy be? Because we've got an audience that um, want to kind of see what happens in every show because that's the generation of people on social media that want to consume everything. So, like, a band goes on tour and they want to see videos from every show the band does. But if you're doing a piece of theatre or stand-up comedy where it's, like, the same material every night, it's kind of weird because you're doing the same material every night. And maybe people want to come see you four or five times and they're like, oh, it's a, you know, I want to come see you five times. It's a shame you did the same thing. So we said, you know what? What if we did a show where actually every audience has a completely different experience because then it doesn't seem like we're just doing a stand-up piece or a monologue and we're just doing it lots of times. It's like we've really made something for a live experience where every audience gets to have their own experience, which was uh, really exciting and terrifying. What is hidden in Dan's browsing history? The saucy Shrek fanfic. And what are, what are some of the examples of the things in the show that were interactive? Uh, there were so many. Uh, there was one, there was a um, section called Truth Bombs based on a board game where we just let the audience anonymously roast us, which was a great icebreaker just straight off the bat. We gave people a suggestion question like, what does Dan dream about at night? And then people would be like, oh, Nick Jonas. It's like, oh, his mum naked. Or, you know, it's just like, well, thank you. And then the surprise would be that uh, that we'd never know what we would get so it would be surprised, honest. I mean, we we trusted each other and the people on our crew not to like put something wildly inappropriate on the screen. But for our own enjoyment of it, like the surprise was such an important part of like our genuine reaction to something that we didn't know what it would be that was submitted from an audience member. And every single day it was different content. There was an improv section where we just had to um, convince everybody that something good was actually terrible or something really bad was good. And again, that was just submitted from the audience. And then we just had to improv for like a minute. So someone would be like, Dan, convince us all that dead puppies is actually a good thing. And I'd be like, oh, my God, what member of this audience submitted that? And then I had to do it. And sometimes, I mean, it was always funny. Sometimes it was like really inappropriate. And I was like... (laughs) <laughs> this is just our time in the room tonight but that's what made it a really fun experience for the people that were there it's interesting that you you said you were looking at live entertainment and thinking so here are the tropes what can i do differently absolutely and it's like it's just so weird but i was like i don't want to do a stand-up show that people can see more than once i don't want to even be like a band performing the same songs more than once i this audience has to kind of have their own fresh, unique experience where they feel like they're connecting with you. The reason I like improv is when people go to an improv show, you know that like the connection in the audience is so great because they're all in it together. It's a fresh story. The people on stage will totally be vibing off what the audience is giving them based on what happens. And that's why it's so magical and electric because you know that it's like it's real and it's happening and you're feeding off each other's emotions. So I was like, we have to do that in the show because then just the emotional experience of everyone in the room they'll be so invested and they'll have such a good time because it feels special Uh, yeah i imagine for a lot of uh online talent that because they've got so much control over what they do Mm. because they can edit in such a specific way (laughs) once they then try and translate into a live setting that is terrifying because of the fear of things going wrong but then like what we've learned from this week is that when things 
kind of go do go wrong that is when the kind of magic oh, happens so funny so funny it's finding that inner light oh the whole show is setting us up to fail constantly it's like we were daring the audience to make us feel uncomfortable and it's like because me and my friend phil were quite comfortable supporting each other as performers it's like there could be a situation where everybody just puts me on the spot and i'm having a horrendous time but it's kind of a safe environment and everyone's just enjoying it so it just it felt really good to kind of say like we're really just in your hands right now this is about you make what you will of the evening and then it was always really funny what I also uh, respected about um, yourself and Phil was the way you crafted every element of the live show to the artwork and mm. the, the merchandise that was available. And like, <laughs> yeah. um, tell us a bit more about that process. Well, that's very much the YouTube mindset of like people, they're not just performers. They are the writers, the performers, literally the editors, the cameramen. They do the lighting, the sound. And then they also have to do their own marketing and most of them are their own managers. So people, any self-employed person, doesn't matter if they do like a podcast or even if they're an artist, they end up developing this entire skill set, which is an amazing thing to have. Um, it definitely makes us massive control freaks because when people say, oh, well, you know, there's obviously there's going to be directors, set designers, lighting designers, and they turn up and we're like, here's what we want you to do. <laughs> it's like we give them like, this is what the set's going to look like. This is what the video is going to look like. Here are the sounds. And they're a bit like, what's our job? And it's like, well, we don't actually know how to build a set. We don't know how to program lights or, you know, engineer the sound. We just know what we'd like it to be. So, but that was fun for us because it's, it was a chance to elevate what we did and take it to the next level because we don't know how to design a set, but to have a set designed for us by James Turner, a really amazing, talented person, was just, you know, it was like seeing your dreams come to life. So it was fun. What would you say you're most creatively proud of? Um, I think definitely the two stage shows that I did with Phil were just wild like I don't, the thing is like it's quite a, a niche thing that i feel like only it's like the generational thing again it's like if i tried to pitch it to people over the age of 35 it'd be like a hard sell or they don't really get it because so much of it was based on pop culture and internet references and specifically our channels but just like how creative it was and ambitious it was i'm just like i look back and i'm shocked that we did it almost um but then on my own channel i've made a couple videos that um I feel very proud of as well not even because like creatively i've done a couple weird ones like there was a tour of my brain tag where people like made this brain out of cardboard and the idea was like you'd open a flap and make some jokes about like an aspect of your personality so i'd be like oh this is the corner of broken dreams or whatever i was like oh creative yeah i crafted something and i can't even like draw a straight line that was great but you know when i make a comedy video about mental health it's not that creative but i'm like yeah that's probably the thing i'm most proud of doing yeah, I think um, you should be definitely very proud of your body of work. I think when I think about um, you as a creator, there, there, when you said about authenticity and like consistency, I think hmm. you have a very high consistency across all um, aspects of what you do. So if you even crafting a tweet or a YouTube video or the, the books as well, hmm. like every element of it has a very high attention to detail. That's definitely something that holds me back. In a way, it's like um, I, I have a real fear and people tell me this all the time. It is a bit of a debate in the because I have such a high internal threshold and I know that I'm definitely more ridiculous than I need to be. It's like I'm I'm not Kanye. You know, what I mean, I'm not saying like I'm Steve Jobs. Everything I do is amazing. It's like I think I'm an above average Internet comedian, but it's still like my internal threshold is so high that there's so much I don't do because it's not good enough to me. And other people say like not everything you do has to be amazing but because i'm known for posting less content than other people they're like just give us more and it's that debate of should i loosen up and post more because people would still enjoy it and it would make them happy or whatever or should i you know only keep things below the threshold and i don't think that there is a right or a wrong answer there but um it's just how i feel definitely well you're you're the um you are the hero in your journey. Like you're, <laughs> you're, yeah. you're the one paving that way. That there hasn't been somebody before that you can think, oh, that's a career I really admire. I'm gonna do X, Y, and Z. Oh that god, they yeah, did. making it up as we go along, definitely. So what, uh, what is the the next thing for you? What, what are you excited about doing in the next few years? I mean, I've really enjoyed 
trying new things constantly. It's like the first time I did a book, I loved it. The first time I did a stage show, I loved it. The first time we did radio was terrifying, but we had a great time and we loved it. So I'm always just like, what new things haven't I done yet? I think I'd like to uh, definitely try some more like straight up stand up solo stuff. It would probably end up being ridiculous and theatrical and stupid or whatever, because that's just me, <laughs> but we'd say. Uh, again, and I really like to like write some kind of longer form, like a series, not just a one-off video, but um, some things that are series, because uh, a lot of YouTube is doing a one-off video, and then doing a book or a tour has been like, ah, you write something that's actually two hours or, you know, 300 pages worth of material, and I find I really, really enjoy getting stuck into something for a long amount of time, so I think doing that with comedy so writing a series or doing like a really long special or something that i can spend a while focusing on one project i really enjoy great well thanks for chatting to us dan thanks for having us and for supporting me and teaching me stuff thanks for listening if you want to find out more about us we're on instagram at bbc studios talentworks this podcast is produced by shola Aledje for bbc studios